Welcome everyone to the analysis of the Old Testament survey. This is the after show where we discuss a little bit more in depth about a diff few different points of uh, each of the books. We're on Second Samuel now, and uh, hopefully you just watched Pastor Gavin's uh, synopsis of Second Samuel, and now you've tuned into this. Thank you for doing that. Leave us a comment. We'll talk about it um, in a comment show if we if we get some people that respond. Um, visit Marcus Fredrickson. He does the music in and out of every episode of this series and the Boiling Point podcast, ReverbNation.com slash Marcus Fredrickson. And please check out our storefront, Bonfire.com slash store slash the Boiling Point podcast. Pick up some apparel and support the show so that we can uh, continue to make this uh, series and many other shows for your enjoyment. Um Pastor Gavin, Second Samuel, there's a few points that I definitely would like to hit on. <clears throat> and the first one is going to be, you mentioned um, the Ark of the Covenant in that book, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What, mm -hmm. what is the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is a, uh, it's like a chest that was in the, uh, the tabernacle and later, you know, when Solomon built a temple. It was in the temple in the, uh, the area of the temple called the Holy of Holies or the most holy place, it's also called. And uh, that was a place uh, where only uh, the high priest could go once a year. And even after he had made the appropriate sacrifices. And uh, and uh, so that's the Ark of the Covenant contained the actual uh, tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on. And, okay. uh, and a sample of the manna that God had rained down you know, from heaven for the children of Israel and, uh, and also, uh, Aaron's rod that had budded. It, it, it also contained that as well. But the main okay. thing it contained was the uh, table, the 10 commandments. And so there in the Holy of Holies, it, uh, it was the, the place where God symbolized his presence with the people of Israel. So, okay. uh, yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of people wonder where is the ark today? And yeah, that's yeah, that was my next question. Yeah, so uh, it's and it it's not really like uh, you know Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> um, the uh, and, and like the the Da Vinci Code and stuff like that. That's not yeah. what we're talking about here, right? No, no. Uh, well, I mean, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant, but. <clears throat> it seemed like in those movies they kind of mixed pagan gods with it, you know. Um, gotcha. So, so um, there is a an, an archaeologist named Ron Wyatt, who he believes he was in a cave that went underneath where he believes Christ was crucified. He claims that he saw it under there. So I don't know if that's actually what it was or not. And then. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, a church somewhere in Ethiopia where they claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant and then they're, they're, they've been guarding it generation after generation, uh, you know, underneath their church in an underground uh, cavern or cave or something of that nature. And uh, so, you know, I don't know which is true. Yeah. Uh, we really don't know for certain. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, but one day there's going to be a temple that will be rebuilt by the Jewish people. And, uh, you know, I, I would imagine they'll find it then. Okay. That's and, okay. Now, is that is that speculation on your part? Well, uh, the fact that the temple will be rebuilt, that's not speculation because the uh, scriptures yeah. teach that. But uh, whether or not they'll find the original ark or make a new one, it's speculation on my part that, okay. that they'll probably, you know, like God will reveal to them where it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I didn't know. I, I, wanted, I just didn't know if you were getting that from scripture or if you were just speculating on that point. Remember, that's something we like to do uh, when Pastor Gavin and I talk is, you know, there's there's fact and then there's speculation and then there's sensationalization. Um, right. And, and we don't, we like to, and we don't, yes, we don't sensationalize yeah. here. We don't, that's the point we, we avoid. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, now did I hear you correctly while you were talking, David had multiple wives. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. Go, yes. go ahead. If you have something to comment yeah. on right there. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well, people back then did now God warned the people, like, especially the Kings of Israel, 
not to multiply into themselves wives. And, um, you know, it, it was always God's plan, one man and one woman for life. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, as time went on, sometimes men married, you know, multiple wives and it was a part of their culture. And I think that God was more tolerant of that because it wasn't as clearly revealed to them that it's wrong. Like now you read in the New Testament where it, it gives qualifications for church yeah. leaders. Okay. It says he has to be the husband of, or, uh, yeah, the husband of one wife. In other words, no more polygamy. So that's very clear, but it wasn't as clear in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. Okay. So, yeah. so it was a little looser in the Old Testament. Um, right. Yeah. Now, if I could speculate to you for a moment, um, as to why, and this is, was all speculation on my part, uh, could it be because of the times? This is this is back when mm -hmm. the population yeah. of the world was very small compared to now. Um, and, yeah. and often men being the hunters, gatherers, especially during that time, men would die, go off to war. Um, mm -hmm. and so women would often outnumber the men in cities and stuff. Could that could that just yeah. be that's just speculation on my part? But could, could yes, be yeah, in some yep. Yeah. So sometimes uh, you know the the men would marry the women because their husbands got killed and they had no one to take care of them, and uh, you know then they would have more kids as well. So yeah, um, <clears throat> now for kings, uh, if you were a king, like later on, it says about Solomon, like Solomon was very wealthy. And it says he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Wow. So, um, so why would you need that many? Well, some of it was like a status symbol. Hey, look at me. You know how wealthy I am. I have all these wives. Yeah. And and then I'm having all these kids by a lot of these wives. So, you know, I'm a big dude, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but also part of it was if you were a king and there was a a kingdom near you, like a city state type kingdom, and you didn't want to have any war and you wanted to make sure that there was peace, uh, you know, maybe the king of that city would give you his daughter as a wife. So if you were married, uh, you were family, so you wouldn't attack that city. So some of these were probably the result of military alliances. Now, uh, I'm getting off to King Solomon, but David. Uh, one of his wives, um, her husband died, and David saw that she was a very good woman. And, uh, you know, so so uh, as soon as he found out that her husband died, he married her. So uh, I think that was Abigail. Yeah. And her husband was like a real, uh, real obstinate, hard to get along with guy. So, uh, yeah, so... Uh, it, if I counted correctly, and I believe I have, I think David had five wives at the time that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you got to figure that even if God's a little lenient back at that time on how many wives you can have, and you can have five wives, and you have five wives, cheating on your five wives yeah. just seems really... I mean, doesn't that just seem a little bit blatant, I guess, at that yeah, point, that, right? It makes it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. And now if I get uh because that's kind of um you know, there's a history of that in 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 human history of marrying mm -hmm. multiple women and and procreating and and spreading and and you know spreading the seed and, and creating a, a larger population. Uh as do you think do you just again speculation on my part, do you think that that's why sometimes we see struggles with some of that today? Or do you think it's more of a culture thing than it is because it's in our history? Um, well, uh, it's it's Christianity, uh, I believe, that that sort of put the light on the fact that polygamy isn't God's way. Uh, so, like, uh, it, it, you know, in Muslim countries today, there are a lot of Muslim countries, my understanding is, where they still have multiple wives. Polygamy is still practiced. Uh, so... So I think that's mainly uh, due to the influence of Christianity, because, you know, Christianity made it clear that, you know, God's ideal plan is just one man and one woman. You know, in the Garden of Eden, it was Adam and it was Eve. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then the New Testament affirms that. 
Yeah. Um, so you think so you think the reason why uh, it seems to be such a struggle to, in today's world is because more of a societal thing than it is because it's in our history or in our past or anything like that. Hmm. You know, um, Mormonism uh, used to teach multiple wives. Well, that's and that, and that's, and, that's yeah. still practiced, I believe, in, in Utah, I believe, some places yeah. in Utah still, yeah. Yeah, they're really not supposed to. It's, I, my understanding is it's still against the law, but uh, I think some Mormons do that. And that was one of their big doctrines because uh, they believe that you, you got to have a lot of babies to create spirit babies that'll help you when you rule over your planet one day, or it's, it's really wild, you know, it's, it's out there. Yeah. And I, you know, um, so yeah. So there, there's still some cultures today that practice it, but, but it's definitely not uh, a Christian doctrine. And the new Testament, it reaffirms that yeah. with, you know, with scripture. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now there's a couple of, um, uh, like we do in some episodes where I, I, you know, challenge what you've said on some mm -hmm. things. Um, and of course, you know, it's done out of respect. It's done to help teach people and help people understand what it is that you're right. saying. Because so, someone else would have the same question. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Now, um, so these next two points that I'm going to talk on are, are not just simple questions, but you said that um, David failed. David was a very godly man and he mm -hmm. still failed. How... Yeah. Is, uh, this again, it's a loaded question, but there someone is going to be thinking this in their head if they watched that first episode. I know they are. If God is all knowing, all powerful, why did he let David fall? Well, how can a godly man fail with, with if God's in control and a godly man? How can that happen? Mm, good question. Well, um, see, see, even though David was a godly man and he loved the Lord. Like he still had what the Bible calls the flesh. Um, and the New Testament talks about the flesh, that the flesh uh, desires against what the spirit of God desires. And the spirit of God desires against what the flesh desires. The flesh refers to the sinful aspects of our human nature. And so, so even though we love the Lord, you know, we still have, uh, you know, some sin within us. And so even though David was a godly man and loved the Lord, that there was just a moment of weakness where rather than yielding to and obeying the Lord, he just gave in to the flesh, like he gave in to his sinful desires. And uh, so like what he should have done was whenever he first saw her, he should have said, man, I don't even want to watch that. I'm a married man. I know that would be displeasing to the Lord, but he didn't. And so then as he kept, you know, watching her, I mean, you and I who are guys, we could understand, you know, the, the, the appeal to that of the flesh. I mean, you know, I have no desire to do anything like that, but you could understand why. I mean, yeah. you know, normal guys are attracted to women. So, yeah. so, and, you know, and, uh, so that was the weakness of the flesh. And of course, Satan knows that that could have been David's weakness. And uh, so he was just, you know, in a moment of carelessness, uh, he just chose to love himself at that moment more than he loved the Lord. So he put himself before the Lord. So, you know, you and I who, who are saved and love the Lord, sometimes we do that, you know. Yeah, we, we're not perfect. Yeah, right. We don't want to, but uh, we haven't arrived at sinless perfection yet. And, yeah. uh, so, and you know, if you would have uh, talked to David early that morning and told him what he was going to do, he probably would have said, believe. no way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we don't know else what was going on in his life that made him vulnerable to that temptation. But, you know, we do know this. It says in 1 Corinthians I think it's 10, 13. Uh, it, it says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And in other words, we, we can't ever have a temptation where we'd say, man, this is something no one else has ever experienced because everyone else has experienced the things we go through. You know, maybe their name is different. They're in a different place, but 
We all struggle with different kinds of temptations and we're not the only ones. But it says, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So in other words, God will never allow us to be tempted beyond our ability to resist it and say no. Really? So, okay. Yeah, yeah, God won't allow so that. So David happened. could have said no, but he chose not to. David could have turned away and, you know, said no. Oh, okay. But, I but do, I do, so if I can understand what you just said, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, hmm. God only tempts us as much as we as much as we can handle it, meaning that he okay, doesn't. God, wait, 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 let me stop you there. Okay. Um, the, the Bible says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So God doesn't tempt us. But God, maybe okay. what, but I think what you probably meant to say was that, you know, God will only allow us to be tempted. Yes, I think, yes, that is what I meant to say. So God will only allow us to be tempted as much yeah. as we can handle. Right. So, yeah. so anybody who's being tempted has still at least somewhere inside them has hmm. the ability to say no. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that means that if we sin, we can't blame God. It's our own fault. But the good part of that is if we're responsible, then, then that means we can win over it. But if we're going to blame the devil or, you know, blame the flesh or blame God, well, then we could never get the victory because it's not our fault. So we're helpless. Yeah. So that's the wrong way to look at it. Yeah. Self-responsibility is the way to look yeah. at it. That's that's yeah. what God teaches us, you know, about yeah. it's about ourselves. And we do have free choice and we have to make those choices. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's how a godly man can can <clears throat> sin if, if he's just careless. And uh, when 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 sin is uh, before him and he's being tempted and we're tempted at that moment, we got to say, wait, um, not my will, but thine be done. You know, and, and God, what you want and what you say is more important than me and what I want and and the stupid you know, sinful desires of the yeah. flesh. So Lord, I want to obey you. And if, if we're, if we're struggling with sin or with temptation, uh, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to pray and ask God to help us. Like uh, in Hebrews, I think it's chapter four. It says, um, it talks about Jesus being our high priest. It says, we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. Um, so let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So what that's saying is, hey, if we sin, we're to come to God and confess it and ask his forgiveness. If we're struggling with temptation, uh, and and we feel weak and, and like we're going to give in, you know, we should pray, Lord, please. I don't know why I'm feeling this. I know it's wrong. I don't want to do what's wrong. I don't even want to be tempted to do what's wrong. Please help me and give me the strength. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. But did David do that? No. <laughs> no, he just gave in. Yeah. 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 And there's about three things that you just said there that I could probably go off on tangents on, but I want to don't want to. We're already running this episode longer than the actual synopsis of the book we just covered. So let I'm going to put those in my pocket and uh, save those for later. One yeah. last one last thing though, you said it um, because of his sin, uh, God told him that a child was going to die. Which yeah. I want to be which which child whose was it? Yeah, that was the child that was conceived by their adultery. By their adultery. Okay, yeah. and now my, my yeah, father Bathsheba was, yeah, Bathsheba was pregnant to David. And, uh, you know, so the Uriah the Hittite was killed, you know, because David basically used the sword to kill him. Not directly, but, yeah. yeah I mean, if he sent him out and told the, you know, told Joab, hey, put him out by the city wall and then quickly withdraw. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. He knew what was going to happen. So, 
So when that child was born, you know, David prayed and asked God to save the child's life, but you know, God said no. So, so and now my follow up to that is God does God often punish children for the sins of their father? Yes, I loaded that and I loaded that question and asked it in a way that other people would ask it. Yeah. Yeah, good good question. Good way to phrase it too. Well, uh, God God doesn't punish children for the sins of their fathers, but children can be affected by their father's sins. Okay. So so um, you know, that it, it's not that that child was being punished because of David and Bathsheba's adultery, but as a result of it, God was going to take the child uh, you know, as, as a discipline to David and Bathsheba. So, so it, it wasn't that the child was being punished for their sins, but, but the child was affected by their sins. Okay. But if you look at it this way, um, uh, that child went to heaven. Like yeah. that child went to be with the Lord in God's presence. Now, how do we know that? Uh, well, they said to David, hey, David, you know, the child's dead. And uh, David said, um, I shall go to him, but he shall not return me. So in other words, you know, when David would die, he would go to paradise. Well, that's where the child would be too. Like I believe the teaching of scriptures that little children go to heaven. So was that so bad for that child that he was taken directly to heaven? I mean, uh, he, he kind of got off lucky, you know, he missed yeah. out on a lot of bad things in this world. And, and uh, so, yeah, so uh, yeah, good question. The child, uh, in spite of how it might look to some people, the child was affected by the parent's sin, uh, but not, not, okay, I'm going to, instead of punishing David and Bathsheba, I'm going to punish the child. Uh, no, no, God didn't do that. Yeah. Um, so, yep, that was that's the last point that I wanted to hit on there. Um, I think we just about covered everything and then some uh, here for Second Samuel. Our after show went way longer than than the than the synopsis of the book went, but that's okay. I think we talked about some great things. Please leave us a comment if you have any questions yourself. We'll be happy to do a Q and A episode um, and answer some of your questions. And we're still talking about maybe doing a live episode once we've completed the entire series. So look for that. Um, and they come out, <clears throat> they release every Sunday night on the Boiling Point Podcast channels, YouTube, Rumble, and they air every Wednesday night on Pastor Gavin's channel um, is when they'll be released on Pastor Gavin's YouTube channel. Um, and then the after show will release on the opposite. Like for Sunday, the Pastor Gavin's portion will air on the Boiling Point Podcast channel. Um, and Sunday night, the after show will air on Pastor Gavin's channel. Wednesday his portion airs on his channel and then the after show will be put on my channel. I probably just confused everybody and that's where we'll leave it there. Marcus Fredrickson does the music. Make sure you check him out. ReverbNation.com slash Marcus Fredrickson. The name of the song is called free. Make sure you give it a listen and share it out. Make sure you also please check out our storefront bonfire.com slash store slash the boiling point podcast, pick up some apparel and uh, help support us. Please hit the like button, hit the share button. Facebook is still trying to crush us. We need your help to, to continue to grow our shows. And that's Pastor Gavin, too. Make sure you look for Pastor Gavin. Just search Gavin Whitcomb Sr. on YouTube. You can find his channel there. Uh, for, I am not your host on this series. I am the analyst of the Old Testament survey. Pastor Gavin is the host of the Old Testament survey. And that's the end. <laughs>